Great. Um, okay, so welcome everyone um, to today's guest lunch seminar. I'm really happy to, to have Olivia uh, Linke, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, um, today to talk about contributions of lapse rate feedbacks to Arctic amplification. Um, I'm going to pass this on to, to Ann to introduce uh, the speaker, uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to discuss uh, a little bit about protocol during the seminar, as we've done in the past. If you have a question, just please write um, that question in the chat, or you can just indicate that you have it, and, and I'll unmute you. Um, we are recording this presentation, so it's going to be uploaded uh, within about a week or two. Um, and I believe that covers it, so Anne, I'm going to pass it off to you right now. Okay, thanks, Clara, and thanks, Olivia, for joining us uh, for this GIST seminar. Um, I met Olivia in uh, Leipzig, where she's a PhD student working uh, with Johannes Kwasa's group, and with the major AC3 um, project that I think we'll hear more about in a minute. Um, so AC, the AC3 project, I'm putting in the link here, a link to the uh, Mosaic expedition, uh, which uh, started in late 2019, was a big icebreaker, um, frozen into Arctic sea ice and traveled through variously uh, through the sea ice. And it's billed as the largest polar expedition in history, that is Mosaic. And AC3 um, participated in this, as well as in a number of other um, field campaigns. And uh, just to provide a little bit of context, this happened a little over 20 years um, after the historic uh, Sheba campaign, which was another really big multi-agency international campaign involving an icebreaker. And a lot of lessons learned uh, were applied uh, from Sheba to Mosaic uh, as well. So uh, I, when I visited uh, Leipzig uh, late last year, um, I had to confess to Olivia that I really don't understand how lapse rate feedback works or maybe even exactly what it is. <laughs> she was really kind to explain to me the basics. And I thought um, some folks at guests might appreciate the explanation as, as well. So um, without further ado, uh, thanks to Olivia. Pass it to you. Yes, uh, thank you for the nice introduction. So, um, and especially thanks to you, Anne, uh, for inviting me to contribute to your lunch seminars after you visited Leipzig. So, as already mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Leipzig, um, where I work in this nice AC3 project, which uh, is covering the broad topic of Arctic amplification. And in my PhD topic, I'm specifically looking at one process that is thought to contribute largely to the fact that the, the warming is very much amplified in the Arctic region. So um, this uh, sub-project is supervised uh, by Johannes Kvass, who I'm mostly working with. And um, unfortunately, I'm on the modeling side, or maybe I shouldn't say that, but I am not actually participating in the nice campaigns that Anne mentioned. Um, so most of the results you will see are really um, strictly constrained to what comes out of GCMs. So um, no fancy um, campaign results, but anyway, um, I'm trying to, ah, okay, now it works. Um, so those are the, the topics I would like to cover today and feel free to interrupt me at any point if there are any things not clear or if I didn't, under, uh, if I didn't explain anything um, that well. So just to be on the same page, I want to briefly introduce you to uh, the idea of the lapse rate feedback and how it actually shapes Arctic amplification. Before I go more deep and discuss what actually governs the specific feedback, and we are mostly looking in that subject on an energetic framework, um, more precisely how surface energy fluxes and atmospheric transport change in the warming climate and how this might shape the feedback. Um, and the last two points address then the question how the lapse rate feedback actually contributed to Arctic warming and also to Arctic amplification. Okay, so um, as a quick introduction, um, you can see some time series here. Um, on the left side, this is the warming as a time series on a global average um, from two or three different data sets. So you can see um, we have the observational side covered by PISTEM, we have reanalysis, and we also have the GCM data from CMIP6. So the black curve that you can see is um, a multimodal average that um, is carried out by taking the output from more than 50 different climate models 
And you can see that um, the warming with respect to a reference period, which we define as the average of the 30 years ongoing from 1951, you can see that the, the, the surface, the, the atmospheric temperature close to the surface clearly warms by this one Kelvin, um, which we know. Um, but if we um, now slice out only the Arctic region and look at the warming trend there, we can see um, that this is very much larger than what we experience on a global scale. Um, so this is the phenomenon which we address as Arctic amplification, so the amplified warming trend in the northern polar region. Um, and this phenomenon is even better expressed by putting the plot in this way. So now you can see the data on the distance and um, as a latitudinal dependency. And you can see, especially during the past decades, that we have this very strong warming trend in the northern polar regions, um, which is like a factor two to three times larger, depending on the data set you're looking at. So this is very interesting to study in general. Um, the lab rate feedback, or let's start, the Arctic amplification itself is um, a complex process which um, results from multiple processes and also feedback mechanisms. And the lab rate feedback um, next to the surface albedo feedback is thought as to be one of the feedbacks that further push this amplified warming in the, in the Arctic. So if we look at lab rate feedback, this is expressed as the warming that comes or cooling that comes from the lab rate feedback. We can see um, that we have this zonal mean curve that comes from all our CMIP-6 models that we are using, like we use the historical simulations. Um, and we can see that the warming or cooling contribution from the lapse rate feedback really depends on the region we are looking at. So um, these thinner curves, they show you the individual model results and the thick curve is the, the average over all the models. But we can see that particularly in the northern polar region that we have um, this strong tendency of a warming impact. Whereas when we look at the, the mid-latitudes and also the tropics, we can see that the lapse rate feedback tends to cool. So cooling in that sense that it actually counteracts the initial radiative forcing, which is mostly driven by um, the anthropogenic greenhouse effect. Um, but in the, in the polar regions and primarily in the Arctic, we have a warming contribution. And this is exactly why it, this feedback contributes to Arctic amplification, because actually on a global scale, it would rather tend to cool, um, but then warms in the Arctic. So this is why this feedback is so interesting, um, and it's far less understood than, for instance, the albedo feedback. So to understand why the lateral feedback behaves like that, or why there is this strong dependency on the latitude, um, we have to understand, okay, what actually defines this feedback. And the left side feedback arises from the warming that is vertically non-uniform. So you can just look at this simple sketch. Um, we're presenting now the tropics, and we have our reference climate or our reference temperature profile, and assuming that this um, that the warming we experience is the same in each layer of the troposphere, then we wouldn't have a lapse rate feedback. So what we see here with this uniform warming would be strictly the result of a plant feedback. But the reality looks different. Like in reality, in the tropics, um, we have the surface warming, but then if you move up in the troposphere, the warming gets higher. So this is due to the fact that we have deep convection, this constant latent heat release in the upper layers of the troposphere, um, and this causes the temperature profile to follow a moist adiabat. So this is why in a warmer world, also the warming gets higher um, in higher layers of the, of the troposphere. And the result of this is that this stronger warming in higher layers actually aids the ability of the atmosphere to, to cool, comparing to a warming that would, would be vertically uniform. So this works against the, the initial greenhouse effect. And this is why we see this negative feedback tendency in the tropics and also in the mid-latitudes. Um, in the Arctic, or also in the Antarctic, however, the situation is different. So we have a very stable boundary layer, especially in winter and over sea ice. Um, and the warming due to this limited mixing is very much forced to stay at the surface. And then it gets muted higher up in the trop troposphere. Um, and due to this um, limited 
um, vertical exchange, um, the atmosphere is also limited in radiating away the surplus energy from the surface. So this is why in the Arctic and also in Antarctic, we have this positive feedback contribution due to the bottom heavy warming, which is forced to stay in the lower boundary layer. Um, where this is just a simple sketch, we can also look at actual data. So this is the, um, the temperature change of the past 30 years on average with respect to our reference period. And this is um, data I took from Euro 5. And we can see already what is kind of sketched on the left side that we have this strong bottom heavy warming um, in the Arctic region. But then if we move higher up, we see the warming is not that strong. But if we then look into the equatorial regions, we can say that there is a weaker warming and um, it tends to increase with height. So this is exactly what um, drives this, this feedback response with latitude. Okay, so another question is, um, we essentially use this temperature difference or the, the difference in the temperature profiles between reference climate and present day climate as an input. Um, but how can we calculate the actual climate feedback from this? So one way to do that is to use so-called uh, radiative kernels. So these radiative kernels, they are pre-computed um, yeah, tools um, that come from different um, radiative transfer models. I just listed some here at the bottom. So I tried this method for different kernel outputs, um, but actually the results, they don't differ so much. So I think um, the results that I present you, I'm sticking to this patch M3 kernel, because it, the choice of kernels didn't really show much of an impact. So we take this kernel and this kernel essentially gives you the change in top of atmosphere radiation balance due to a small perturbation of your climate relevant variable you're interested in. So this is the delta chi. Um, and for the left right feedback, we're interested in the temperature. This is a temperature feedback. Um, and for this, the, um, the, the um, the model is perturbed by one Kelvin. So this is how this kernel is pre-computed. And then to derive the feedback, we can derive it as a feedback parameter. This is like the standard method to do so. We take the kernel and multiply by the actual change of our feedback variable, that chi. And then normally this is also weighted by the, the temperature change of the surface. So if we just apply that to um, to our lapse rate, we know, okay, what we're interested in is this portion of vertical warming that's non uniform. So delta chi would be essentially the temperature change in each layer, and then always subtracting the surface warming. So essentially subtracting uh, the plant feedback. Um, and so we apply this equation and um, then integrate over the troposphere because, um, yeah, we have it in different layers. And then we arrive at our unit, which is a common unit to describe feedbacks, what per square meter per Kelvin. Um, the thing is that this unit is not super intuitive. So it's much nicer to look at a feedback as an actual warming or cooling contribution in Kelvin. So how we proceed is by looking at the local energy budget. And this is a method that has been applied in multiple studies before. So um, if we look at a single column in the atmosphere, then we know that all of these factors that are shown here are in balance. So we have in our climate change scenario or in our real world scenario, we have forcing. And then we have all the feedbacks that also impact um, the, the, the final strength of the initial radiator forcing. So we have the Planck feedback, which is the most important one. And then the other ones are the left rate feedback, then there's also water vapor feedback, cloud feedback, and um, albedo feedback. And then um, also the ocean heat uptake change matters, of course. Um, and if we look not on a global average, but we look into each specific atmospheric column, we also need to consider the, the change in atmospheric heat transport. So adding all these um, radiation contributions or this um, climate contributions together, then we should end up at zero. Um, and the, the little trick is that we can split the Planck feedback into a global mean value and a deviation from the global mean. And then if we apply that to our equation and just bring the 
temperature change on the left side, um, we can get the, the warming contribution from each of these factors simply by dividing by the global mean climate feedback. So um, we could do that for all the factors. It has been done in several studies. Um, here I only look at the lapse rate feedback because that's what I'm mainly interested in. So essentially I derive this lambda by the radiative kernel method um, and then multiply by the, the, the temperature change at the surface and then dividing by the plant feedback, global mean plant feedback. And then by this simple um, approach, we get our feedback, but not in watts per square meter per Kelvin, but actually in Kelvin. So this is just more, um, more, intuitive, more intuitive to see, okay, how did the lapse rate feedback actually contribute to warming or cooling? Okay, so we can have a first look um, at, at our lapse rate feedback. So what you can see here is exactly what I carried out with this method I just presented. So you have the lapse rate feedback in the Arctic. This is um, a model average from all my CMIP models that I was able to use um, on a monthly basis. And you can see the dots, they represent the, the sea ice cover that's present per month. And always the feedback is expressed as the past 30 years of the historical simulations, which ended uh, 2014 in CMIP with respect to the reference period. Um, and the first impression is that, of course, um, what we see here, there is a, a strong seasonal dependency of the lapse rate feedback. So if we just kind of make a cut here in the middle and we look um, to the left side, which represents um, the darker season, we can see there is a um, strongly positive lapse rate feedback, especially over regions where we know that there is um, a strong sea ice reduction. Like, for instance, looking at this um, barents karas region or the East um, Greenland outflow region, um, the lapse rate feedback tends to be strongly positive, but overall is positive over the CS covered area. Whereas if we look on the right side, which is the sunlit season, especially June, July, August, where we have the most solar incoming radiation, we see that the feedback over CS actually switches sign and becomes negative. So over these regions in summer, the feedback contributed to cooling. Uh, we can just also look at this um, Pan-Arctic averaged um, seasonal dependency, which is just, um, again, supporting all of these plots. Um, so the strongest positive feedback comes from a period ongoing from November to yeah, February, March. And then in June, July, August, the overall feedback switches sign and rather contributes to cooling the Arctic. So um, from the first um, impression that we got from these plots and the spatial distribution, we can already guess that the sea ice probably has a large impact in how this feedback behaves. So what we did here um, are intermodal correlation maps of the lapse rate feedback itself and the change in sea ice concentration. Um, and we can see the dots, they represent now um, correlation coefficient threshold of 0 0.6. And we can see if we again look into our dark season that there is um, um, a widespread overall robust correlation, like a negative correlation, which means that models that um, have a stronger reduction in sea ice also tend to have um, a more positive lapse rate feedback. Um, and these correlations are hardly very strong. Whereas if we look into um, our more sunlit season on the right side, we can see that the correlation degrades. Um, and especially over some parts of the sea ice, sea ice covered area, we can see that actually the correlation coefficient switches signs. So that means that um, models that have a stronger summer ice melt actually experience a more negative lapse rate feedback. That's why the correlation um, starts to get positive. And this again, supported by this um, Pan-Arctic correlation per month, we see um, the strongest correlation in the winter season from February, but then the correlation gets weaker and weaker. And essentially in summer, the correlation doesn't exist anymore because then apparently the surface just has less control over the, over the feedback. So we might wonder what actually governs the lapse rate feedback. Um, so what we did in the first study is looking at um, the changes in the energy budget or in change in the individual fluxes that govern the energy budget in the atmosphere. 
Um, and so what the, the terms that define this energy budget are first the, the turbulent heat fluxes of the surface, and we have the radiation budget, um, and also the transport convergence, of course, um, shapes the, the overall energy balance. And all of these factors in a warming world have the impact to also shape the lab spec feedback in the way they change. So um, what I will present now is uh, are some results from our previous studies from last year, um, where we actually looked at idealized simulations. So not to be confused, the results I showed before um, are more realistic results from the historical simulations of CMIP. So we actually have the historical forcings. Um, whereas what we did in the first approach, just to get um, a strong signal, is to look at um, these quadrupled CO2 scenarios. So we looked at simulations that had um, no forcing, only the CO2 forcing, which is quadrupled with respect to pre-industrial levels. Um, and most importantly, what was sticking out in the study is the change of turbulent heat fluxes at the surface and the transport and this interaction between these two. Actually, the radiation budget did not change much, even in these um, strong forcing scenarios. So um, these are two plots which are included in this paper. Um, you can see on the left side the anomalous um, surface heat flux. This includes both sensible and latent heat flux at the surface. And on the right side, we have the, the change in atmospheric energy convergence. Um, and these hashed areas here represent sea ice retreats. So they have sea ice in the pre-industrial levels, but then in the, in the climate change scenario, the sea ice completely vanishes. And what we see, two important things to, to remember from this is that we have already previously mentioned um, region of the balance currency, a strong heat input from the surface due to the, the sea ice retreat. So um, the positive values account for more um, for, for heat fluxes that are stronger now from the surface into the atmosphere. So this would contribute to warming, whereas if we look at these open ocean areas here, um, the fluxes are actually getting more negative. So less positive in the end, because normally the ocean pumps in heat to the atmosphere, but this is weakened in a warmer climate. And um, the other important point is that we can see the reaction of the, the transport. Um, which is the main mechanism to ensure the local energy budget within each column. Because the radiative fluxes, they actually don't change much, but the, the immense heat input from the surface has to go somewhere. So this is why over the, over the, at the sea ice retreat region, we see that the energy convergence actually decreased. Whereas over ocean, because um, the heat flux from the surface became weaker, um, there needed to be more convergence into the atmospheric column above. So these are um, two points that um, were shown. And the question remains now, how did this anomalous um, behavior of the surface fluxes and also the energy transport shape Arctic amplification? Um, so we have uh, these, these plots now from the idealized simulations on the right. Um, and now the annual mean, yeah, I forgot to say these are annual mean um, plots. And so is the lapse rate feedback we have here on the left side. Um, again, the dots represent the sea ice area. And one main thing we can see is that over the sea ice retreat region, we also have the strongest positive uh, lapse rate feedback. Whereas if we go south of the sea ice edge, it becomes yeah, slightly negative, um, which very much links to, to the surface fluxes. So in the end, we already can guess that there is a strong heat or a strong impact from these uh, alterations of the surface heat fluxes um, from the annual perspective. But um, it's also interesting to look at the seasonal connection of these alterations with the Arctic lapse rate feedback. So in the next um, plot, you can see now the seasonal behavior of the lapse rate feedback. Like in gray, you can see the, the Pan-Arctic average. Um, of feedback per month, um, but then also the, the um, discrimination between different surface types. So in blue, we have the sea ice, um, which already shows this uh, negative contribution in, in summer. And then we also have areas of sea ice retreat. So they, they had um, sea ice in the, in the reference period, but then in the present day period, the sea ice is not there anymore. 
And on the right side, um, from our idealized study, we have um, the changes in the in the heat fluxes, like this is sensible, this is latent, and also and the convergence of energy and the way it changes. Um, so please only pay attention to um, to the sea ice and the sea ice retreat. Blue accounts for the ocean and um, green for land, but this is less interesting um, because the lateral feedback is not very strong over these regions. And if we start looking into the upper right panel for the sea ice region, we can see that um, the heat fluxes both sensible and latent actually slightly decreased. Um, and this falls together which, uh, with what we see that the depth rate feedback also becomes negative. And this is due to the fact that over sea ice, um, you essentially can warm as much as you like um, due to the summer ice melt, the skin temperature is always fixed at melting point. So this bottom heavy warming has a limitation there, um, whereas the atmosphere higher up still warms. So this is why we actually have this negative feedback contribution here. And also the, the, the heat fluxes that decrease due to the warmer atmosphere, but uh, the surface temperature is always constrained to zero degrees. So um, it tends to be more negative, so more towards the surface. Um, whereas if we look into the winter period, we see the opposite is the case. Um, we have a slight increase in the heat fluxes. And this falls together with um, the positive feedback we have in December, January, February. Um, and the reason for this um, can be many. Simply, we have probably warmer ocean temperatures due to the increased absorption during summer, um, but also um, thinner ice in a warmer world. And also in future ice scenarios, there is like a, um, a shift of the onset of refreezing more into the cold period because um, of the warmer ocean temperatures due to the increased solar absorption in summer the the onset of refreezing gets delayed and refreezing always means latent heat release and if this is delayed and more shifted towards the cold season that could also contribute to this increase and we have over sea ice um, so this is why we have this switching sign and this is mostly controlled by the by the surface heat fluxes whereas if we look at the, our red curve sea ice retreat um, the feedback is always positive but more positive um, in the winter season, whereas, um, which also reflects in the surface heat fluxes, like we see this very strong increase um, in winter. So there is um, a connection here. Um, so I talked a lot about the surface fluxes, but um, not so much about the transport. So this is um, kind of an open question because of course the transport that's mostly reacting to close the, the energy balance um, can also shape the, the vertical temperature profile and the way it changes. So uh, the simple thought chain of that is that if we focus on the sea ice retreat region now, we do have this strong um, increase in the surface heating, which feeds into the bottom heavy warming. But if the energy is forced to diverge from the atmospheric column, that might further um, impact uh, the tropospheric cooling or the muted tropospheric warming. Um, so it's not really clear what what this contribution might be. Um, but the question is mainly if the Arctic feedback, uh, Arctic lapsuit feedback is um, a surface phenomenon or is, if the transport has a bigger part of that. So um, what I did here are Again, correlation maps um, between all the models we have um, for the lapse rate feedback and the temperature change at each level. And these are annual mean maps. Lab, uh, annual mean maps. So you can see that um, if we go at the lowest pressure level and we correlate the temperature field or we correlate the, the temperature with the lapse rate feedback, we can see that um, this web correlation is mostly very strongly positive. Um, and also at the higher layers, it's still positive, but then if we move up in the atmosphere, this correlation actually decreases. So looking at this again from a panarctic perspective, there is a clear signal that uh, the lapse rate feedback is mostly constrained by what happens at the surface. Mm. Yeah, so to answer this first question, what governs the Arctic lapse rate feedback? Um, from what we see here is that it actually is mostly controlled 
controlled by local processes at the surface, with the sea ice playing a major role by altering the surface heat fluxes. And this correlation is um, particularly strong during winter, but then it gets weakened in summer when also the sun plays a role, and also when the feedback is not very strong. Um, and the, the, the energy transport convergence, we cannot really attribute it here, um, but one might actually be able to learn more if we vertically resolve the, feed, uh, the transport because um, in what I showed here, it was treated like as, an, um, as a vertical interflow. So um, this is an open question which we can further address. Um, and I want to mention that there are actually some studies and one that I'm aware of from Fed et al. 2020 that did look at this remote influence from the transport on the left right feedback. And what they did is they, they kind of split the feedback into a contribution from the surface or from the lower boundary layer and an upper left right feedback. And they, they showed that the climate models that have a stronger tendency for this diverging pattern also had a more positive left right feedback. So this is actually what I, what I kind of wanted to express in this sketch. And so there are studies for this but I think uh, there can be more uh, that we can learn from that. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Olivia, but can I just yes. ask one question about that? Um, of course. So um, my understanding too was that one of the um, other kind of points that Nicole was, I'm not sure expressing in this paper, but has also kind of suggested is that um, typically the transport's not kind of decomposed into its moist versus dry components. And if you do that, then, um, then that also kind of helps to highlight the role of this kind of non-local contribution from the transport convergence to, is that yeah. maybe kind of something too that's consistent with what you've seen or uh, just wondering if you had any thoughts on that? Um, I haven't actually split the, the contributions from the transport because um, I kind of treat it as a residual in our studies. Um, but I think most of it comes from the dry static energy transport. Okay. Whereas the more static energy transport should actually decrease. Um, I hope that's, no, I think it's the other way around. But um, anyway, this is something that we can consider, but I haven't done it so far because I didn't actually look into this feedback parameter in a more deep way, like decomposing it and also vertically resolving it. But I think it could be interesting. Great. Thank you. To do that. <laughs> yep. Um, Exactly. So um, some things that can be done still, but now to um, actually come to the main question of this talk is um, from our historical simulations, which are more close to reality than these idealized simulations, how did the, the left right feedback um, actually shape optic warming? Um, and so we have the time series here again, like in the beginning, but this is now the warning that entirely comes from the left right feedback. Um, and we see also the decomposition into different surface types. So as um, previously already thought, uh, the sea ice switch regions are the ones that contribute the most, followed by sea ice, um, and the less positive contribution comes from land and ocean areas. But overall, we see um, all surface types seem to have this positive tendency in the left side feedback. So the question is now, how did that actually contribute to the total warming? So we can express this feedback um, in percent. So um, with relation to the total warming, so essentially just dividing um, the temperature change by the feedback by the total warming. Um, and then we can look at this map. And um, this again supports that this um, barnes karasi region uh, where we have the, the strongest lapse rate feedback is also the region where that absolute feedback contributed most to the warming itself. So we are at values between yeah 40 and more percent um, where the warming comes from the lapse rate feedback. And if we calculate the average value, we can say that 20% um, of the overall Arctic warming actually came from this feedback. Mm -hmm. So that's not little. Um, but if we again split maybe for different seasons, um, the question remains if the left side feedback did only contribute to warming or if it also um, did some cooling there. So we can further split this or break it down again by season and by surface type. Um, so we have um, our surface types now on the x-axis 
Um, and uh, the crosses they present the annual average. So this is what comes from this from this map. So as already expected, um, it's it's always positive the contribution, and most of it comes from winter, which is the the circles that we can see here. Um, whereas if we look at the, the summer period, actually the lapse rate feedback was uh, have had the tendency to cool. So overall, the atmosphere was still warming, but the feedback was negative. So it actually cooled quite a lot, especially over sea ice, by 60%. Then again, the warming in summer itself is not so large. So on an overall impact, it is not that much, even though this um, percent contribution seems a lot here. So um, how did the feedback contribute now to this um, latitudinal dependency of um, the warming we experience. So, I mean, it could be that the lapse rate feedback contributes to Arctic warming, but warms even more on a global scale, like, for instance, the water vapor feedback does. But it's not the case. Um, so, what uh, we see here in this plot is uh, the global mean warming on the x axis and also the Arctic mean warming. Um, and just to attribute it also to the impact of the other feedbacks that contribute to Arctic amplification, we um, have here color coded the lapse rate feedback, plank feedback, and albedo feedback, and um, the entire warming. And this this middle line or the the um, y equals x line is where the global mean warming exactly equate or equals the, the Arctic warming. So everything above this line would then mean that this uh, specific process contributes to Arctic warming or Arctic amplification. Sorry. Um, and we can see even though the, the albedo feedback has a stronger impact on Arctic warming, so overall the Arctic feedback is stronger, uh, the, the, sorry, the albedo feedback is stronger in terms of warming contribution, but it's also positive on a global scale, whereas the feedback, the lapse rate feedback is negative on a global average. So this is why if we look at the distance to this, uh, to this diagonal, um, we actually would have kind of the same contribution to Arctic amplification comparing those two feedbacks. So, I mean, previously thought the albedo feedback would be the strongest. Um, it is in terms of warming, but not in terms of amplification. And then uh, also the plank feedback is important, but um, it's less strong than those other two. So, um, looking again more specifically at the lapse rate feedback, we can also just um, apply this plot. By the way, I forgot to say the um, the less um, or the more shaded squares are the individual models, and then the more distinct dots represent the model average again. And here on the right side, now we have the the model averages, but for different seasons. And um, again, it's the same plot: global mean and Arctic mean warming. And we can see the largest contribution to Arctic amplification comes from from winter. And then if we go towards um, summer, like June, July, August, we have um, even in July a negative contribution to Arctic amplification, but it's not very large. So in summer, um, I would rather classify it as um, neutral in terms of AA. So um, we can say all year this feedback contributes to Arctic amplification with a small exception in July. And in general, the, the summer seasons are not that interesting in that regards. Um, so one last thing which we can discuss is the question which models are more realistic, because most of the time uh, the results I've been showing, they represent the model averages, which is fine. Um, but we can actually see if we plot for individual models that there is a large spread in the GCMs regarding Arctic Arctic amplification and Arctic lapse rate feedback. So we have uh, the feedback here on the x-axis. This is the, the Panarctic average value, and each dot accounts for individual models. Um, and on the on the y-axis, we have like um, a mean to quantify Arctic amplification simply by dividing Arctic warming minus global warming. And then we can see amongst the models there is a strong correlation, which is what we expect. So it's good that the results show that. Um, and to, to distinguish if, or to, to, to attribute them to a realistic data set, we took in um, this 
um, discrimination between strong and weak Arctic amplification models. So um, we can adjust that still, but um, we choose to, uh, to take the five strongest models in terms of Arctic amplification and the four, uh, the five weakest, which also are the ones that have the weakest left side feedback. Um, and then we can take in another data set, which, um, which used to be era five. Um, and we can actually see that already from this plot, the reanalysis um, show that it's more realistic what strong Arctic amplification models say. So most of the models actually underestimate the impact of the left side feedback. Um, whereas for Arctic amplification, it's more in the, yeah, still in the higher range, but um, more acceptable or close to the model average than the feedback. Um, and if we carry that out in a, in a final plot, I'm sorry, it might be a bit busy. We now put together all the information that we have, like we have the discrimination by surface type, um, we have a discrimination by season, and this expresses the, the left rate feedback in terms of warming. Um, and these box whisker plots, they show or they include the results of all the models that we have. Um, the squared um, markers, they, they show the strong Arctic amplification models, the axis, the weak ones. Um, and as a red circle, we have the, the era five results. Um, and mostly how we can summarize it, if we look at the, the autumn season, that era five agrees well with the models. Um, it's not within the range of the model average or the median, but um, so it tends to be more uh, related to the stronger Arctic amplification scenarios, but still um, it's realistic. Um, and also still in December, it moves more towards strong Arctic amplification models, especially with sea ice, um, but it's still within the range. So it seems to agree quite well. Whereas if we look now into the space season, um, we can see that overall surface types, is maybe a small exception of the ocean, but not so interesting anyway, uh, we can see that the models seem to largely underestimate um, the lapse rate feedback. And also the same accounts for, for summer, um, um, exception over, over sea ice, where all the models seem to agree that at least the feedback is negative. Um, and also so all the discriminations into our different subsets, they match, um, but still um, on the panarctic scale and also over the the remaining surface types we see that also here the models seem to underestimate um, the lapse rate feedback. So um, this is the main result from this um, comparison. And um, yeah, I think that's also my final slide. Yeah, so we can summarize what we know so far. Um, what is interesting is to see that one fifth of the overall Arctic warming actually came from the lapse rate feedback. Um, if we look at on an annual scale with um, the, the winter se season being even more extreme. Um, this is also due to the fact that um, the albedo feedback has its peak in summer where we have solar radiation, um, which uh, has a strong impact on this um, albedo behavior that's due to the CIS retreat. Um, but in, in winter, the albedo feedback goes to zero. So kind of the lapse rate feedback takes over. Um, so we have this strong winter contribution here. Um, and also the correlation to what happens at the surface is much higher. Yeah, so most of this comes from um, the CIS control on the surface fluxes with a question mark on the transport. Um, and the strongest contribution clearly comes from sea ice and sea ice retreat, which um, shows um, partly in winter a warming that's equal to the to the global mean value of the overall warming. So one Kelvin. Um, we have this contribution to Arctic amplification throughout all seasons. Um, only in summer, the, the impact on Arctic amplification would be zero, kind of. Um, and if we if we classify the performance of individual models, we can say that um, the strong Arctic amplification scenarios tend to be more realistic. Um, so this is also an interesting point. Okay, 
So I think um, my time's up anyway. So um, thanks again for um, yeah, inviting me and for listening. And I'm happy if you have any questions, I try to answer. Great, thank you so much, Olivia. That was a great presentation. Um, do we have any questions or comments? <clears throat> Uh, hi, Oliver. Nice talk. I'm I'm Shanghai, uh, and uh, yeah, you just showed the uh, surface of video feedback is a lot looks much larger that than the left straight uh, um, feedback. Is that right? Um, depends on which season you look at. Like on an annual. Yeah, in an annual mean, in, uh, of course, yeah. yeah, because that would be, would be the feedback is mainly in the sun, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah, the left speed in the winter, but in the annual mean, compare the annual mean, which one? So. Um, I actually, I hope I have the slide. The yeah, um, slide is still, it's yeah. the albedo feedback, it's much large, larger, right? Um, so if we look much at the particle, yeah. If we so this is um, the Arctic amplification um, term. So this is um, Arctic warming minus global warming for each feedback, and we can see in that regards, the at least for the multimodal mean, which is the the bars, mm -hmm. we can see that the feedbacks are fairly close to each other. Okay, so um, it's a in terms of warming, yes, you're right. Then the albedo feedback is stronger. Oh, uh, okay. So it's a simulated magic. How you compared with the cloud feedback? Um, I didn't look at cloud feedbacks at all. Um, these are <laughs> other people from my project. Um, I'm not sure how how strongly the cloud feedback actually contributes to Arctic amplification because there are so many processes involved that uh, can be considered. Um, so this is why I kind of ignored it here because I, I was focusing on those three that um, are known to be a major impact on Arctic amplification, actually. Uh, yeah, I have another question is uh, when you apply the kernels, uh, did you set, did you use the same kernel for clear sky and the cloudy sky or you said you use separate kernels? Um, I use the, the all sky kernel only. But all sky can. I, I know what you mean. Like we can if we distinguish between all sky and clear yes, sky, we can, yeah, we can yeah. uh, extract the cloud signal. Um I just um, didn't do that yet. Okay, I see. Yeah. But this would be a way to to actually quantify the cloud feedback um with the kernels. Mm, okay. Yeah, I think even for the left rate uh, kernels, that, that it's supposed to be different of clear sky and the cloudy sky, right? Mm. Yeah, maybe it's interesting to look at that. Mm -hmm. I, I have kind of a, a naive question, Olivia. Do you, um, so you showed, I think, uh, the contributions just now up to 2014, was it? Is that the same going forward in time? You know those contributions of albedo versus lapse rate and so on. Uh, you mean if uh, if they contribute equally in time? Yeah. In other words, in forty years from now, you know, or um, so the plot you just showed in Shanghai. Um, oh. showed, yeah. The one that I just yeah. Um, so this would be the, the the Arctic amplification contribution, like present day versus. Um, reference period. Yeah, and just, just going forward in time, does that do, do those attributions stay similar or um, do they change? Um, like you mean in, in the future? Mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting question. I didn't look at any um, future scenarios. So, so far, I've been more addressing the past. So, how did the individual feedbacks contribute to this? matter of Arctic amplification in the past. But we could um, take simulations that uh, simulate the, the future and then have a look at how it um, 
evolves. I mean, essentially, both feedbacks are limited to, to sea ice. Um, and as long as we have sea ice, we will have an equal contribution, most likely. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's that my, my guess. So a related question, do you think, um, again, Naive, <laughs> do you think that the, um, uh, the Arctic amplification then would uh, be more similar across climate models if they produced uh, similar scenarios of sea ice cover? So should we think of like the sea ice itself, the modeling of the sea ice as a crucial component to getting Arctic amplification right, or, so to speak? Yes, definitely. So um, in terms of global mean, um, the models are not that far from each other, but they start to deviate as, as, as soon as we look into the Arctic. And this is mostly tied to how the sea ice behaves. So this is one of the factors that contributes to this large spread, that uh, the simulations are just so different in terms of the sea ice production. I mean, yeah, we can so use that. Yeah, it's kind of an emergent constraint, but um, yeah, you're definitely right. Yeah, so it felt like even if we see that the albedo, um, you know, feedback is fairly tight, you know, tightly constrained, um, at least over sea ice, but then, and, and I defer to Zhanghai here too, but then maybe small differences in absorption of the sea ice or other factors mm -hmm. could actually play a big role in simulations if they affect the sea ice evolution itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a thing that. yeah, I think um, both feedbacks are, are largely constrained to the presence. <laughs> I think we're getting Zhang Hai's. Oh, there he is. Yeah, <laughs> I was figuring out if it was a question or not. But yeah, right. Just try muting that. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Thanks. All good. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, and I have a question. Um, so in, in the study, you showed that um, that where you have sea ice retreat, you, you know, you have these turbulent fluxes and that these are balanced by um, essentially um, the atmospheric transport. Um, yeah. And so I guess I'm wondering, you know, how much of that is because, you know, for whatever reason you have a change in sea ice, um that's balanced by the atmospheric transports or, or or how much of the sea ice change is actually due to the fact that you have this anomalous atmospheric uh transport into the region i mean i like guess i'm mean, wondering what, what, what is the driver here you mean if it's the other way around yeah like, well I mean, yeah, yeah. i'm just wondering like if maybe you know the the atmospheric transports come first i mean how would you know that's not true or you know how would you know that is true yeah, it could be. I mean, um, some of my colleagues look at it exactly from the other way around. They say, okay, we have more moist air intrusions, and then this uh, shapes kind of the behavior of the sea ice retreat. Um, so I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that this is for sure the driver, um, but, but from, I don't know, from my point of view, it would be first the sea ice retreats due to the warming, and then uh, if we expose open ocean, especially in winter, this for sure contributes to the ocean pumping a lot of heat into the atmosphere and this heat needs to go somewhere. So I would argue then this also impacts the, the transport or I mean, um, it's also important to say that this is the transport convergence, not the transport itself. So kind of what stays within the column and what comes into the column um, is the factor we're looking at. And um, yeah, from my understanding, this immense heat input needs to be balanced by energy diverging from the column. The question is in which height does that happen and how does the shape either the warming close to the surface or the warming higher up. Um, so that's why I said maybe it's interesting to resolve that vertically and not treat it as an integrated value. But yeah, um, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, thanks. Welcome. <clears throat> Just to just add one kind of follow up on that. That's where I think um, kind of decomposing it into moist versus dry components mm -hmm. of the transport will be interesting. Maybe there may be some kind of compensation going on. And maybe if you do look at the moist component, at least kind of in terms of the time scale of the response, it may suggest something in terms of what's causing what that may be different yeah. than if you just look at the total kind of convergence. I, I don't know. I'm just speculating here, but 
may, maybe that will will give kind of a better sense of what's leading what. Definitely. I mean, especially distinguishing between dry and moist static energy transport is probably key to answer these questions. I mean, what I show here is really the total energy transport, like this is the sum of dry static, moist, um, kinetic and um, geopotential <laughs> potential um, energy and kind of to especially look at the differences between dry static and moist static because there should be actually a different behavior could be also crucial. In, um, yeah, answering more how this shapes the vertical behavior of the temperature. Yeah. Great, thanks so much. Um, any more questions? Probably a lot of scientific questions <laughs> remaining, but uh, thanks so much, Olivia. That was great. Really nice Thank work. You. Thank you. It was nice to, to speak at your lunch seminar. <laughs> Excellent. Say hi to Johannes for us. I will. Good Thank job you, Olivia. That was really wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks. And just you. a reminder that uh, this will be um, uploaded within a week or two. So. Okay. Great. And thanks, thanks Anne, thanks. for for helping with the discussion. Likewise. Take care. Yep. Bye. Bye.